it is Easter, and uh, I, I don't know for you, but I'm sure there are people in the world who think, why do Christians get so excited and razzed up for this day called Easter? Uh, we do. We, we get excited. We plan ahead. We, we hold services and spend a lot of time thinking through it. And it's because the story of Easter, the true story of Easter, is the story of victory. It's a story of the victory of the King of Kings over sin, death, and the devil. And it's not just our story. It's the story for the whole world. And, but it's not just Christians that love stories of victory. We, we all love stories of victory uh, where light conquers darkness and good triumphs over evil, where life is brought up from death. It saturates the stories we love, the stories that we tell. And I brought a few pictures up here just to kind of remind us of the fact that we all love them. And so they're pictures of some famous villains that are part of stories where good triumphs over evil. You don't have to yell out the names, but I'm curious how many of you know these. Here's our first one. It's more of a recent one from the Marvel Universe, Thanos. Here's our next one, Voldemort from Harry Potter. If you don't know these, there is one coming up for you in that, that generation that will recognize one. The next one, yeah, there you go. Wicked Witch of the West. You young folks are like, I have never seen that. In fact, I heard this week, one of the staff members in his 20s said, I don't even know who that is, but it looks creeper than all the other ones. <laughs> next one, Lord of the Rings, Sauron. Okay, next one. Come on, Vader. Everyone should know who Vader is. Uh, all of these uh, fictional villains we know about because they come from stories where good is triumphing over evil. And, and we love to tell those stories. We love to watch those stories, read those stories. I know there are some in this room that love to watch and read these stories over and over again. Because these stories are really helping remind us of the story that we are all taking part in in this world of the battle between light and and darkness. Moving from fiction to real life, there's a picture that we should all recognize here uh, of a man that lived in the 20th century who brought more evil and darkness into the world than perhaps any other person in human history, Adolf Hitler. And, and I can't tell you how many movies and books and miniseries have been written and, and made about World War II. And, and one of the beauties of the stories that are told is you have nations from all over the world collaborating together to conquer evil. And that's, you know, there's not a lot of things that can bring people together in the world. Uh, but World War II was one of those moments that brought people from different nations, different philosophies and backgrounds against someone perpetrating evil. Um, I'd be embarrassed to tell you how many movies I've watched uh, about World War II. I just finished watching a miniseries on it. But it just never gets old because you love to hear the stories of good triumphing over evil. Jesus' resurrection is not just a story of victory, it's the story of victory. In fact, all of these stories that we watch and read are just borrowing from this greater story that we're all living in where God is overcoming evil with good, life over death. And just like these stories require context for you to understand like what the big deal is, like if you look at Vader and you're like, I don't, if you don't know the story, he's, he's kind of no big deal to you. If you don't know Voldemort and you don't know the story, like it doesn't really make sense. Just like with Jesus, Jesus' resurrection 2,000 years ago didn't just take place in a vacuum randomly. It happened inside of this story that has been going on from the beginning of time, the true story of the state and brokenness that we find ourselves in. And Jesus' victory over the grave is the victory. If you are taking notes, our first point, the most important point, I think this morning, is Jesus' resurrection is a victory. It is the victory. What makes it unique uh, among all stories is that it's both ancient and it's cosmic. What I mean by that is it's ancient in the sense that this story of Jesus entering into the world is taking place in a story that goes all the way back to the beginning of time. It goes back all the way to the beginning of humanity before any of us or the, the grandparents or family members we know lived. It's ancient. But it's also cosmic in the sense that it, there's no person in human history or anything in history that's excluded from this story. All of us find ourselves in this story of brokenness and sin and death in the world, desperation in the world, and God entering into it. And that's exactly what the resurrection is about. Uh, the story of Jesus conquering over all the things that stand against us and between us and God. I want to sketch that story real quick because it is Easter uh, to help us understand the, the story of Jesus. And it starts all the way back at the beginning of time, at the beginning of Zara Bible, where God, this good creator, creates the world that we live in and creates humanity. And even though 
there are times where we question God's goodness and there are people outside of Christianity that, that, that have a, uh, maybe a distorted view of God as being a tyrant and angry. God is good. And God made you not so he could be a tyrant or punish you. He made you for relationship with him. That's, that was the plan. He want, desired to know you and to have a relationship with you and to do life with you forever. That's, that's the world God created. And what happened is at the very beginning, God creates man and woman for himself to thrive with and to flourish with. And the ancient enemy named the devil or Satan, who yes, gets illustrated in all these funny pictures with horns, but is a real being, enters into the situation and does what he can to fracture that relationship between a good God and his people. He sows lies, just like we sang about. He sows deceit and he helps Man and woman, Adam and Eve, turned their back on God and rebel. And when that happened, exactly what God said would happen, happened. This thing called sin enters the world and it infects every single person who's been born. Sin is all, on the one hand, it's an action where we're guilty because we've missed the mark and rebelled. But sin is also a power that infiltrates all of humanity and our thoughts and our minds and distorts us. Sin spreads and with it, death spreads. Death spreads to every human being. We were not supposed to die, and yet now every single human that lives dies. This is not the way God designed it. And also, uh, the Old Testament talks about this place called Sheol, kind of a cool Hebrew word. The New Testament talks about in the Greek as Hades. It's this holding place for the dead, both the wicked and the righteous, those who know God and those who don't. And it doesn't matter who you are, that, at least before Christ, was your destination you would go into the place of death. And the scripture talks about this place uh, as a place that is, uh, you cannot get out on your own. And it's a place where the devil reigns. The devil that the scripture calls the prince of this age. And sin and death are these, yeah, again, personal things, but they're also these cosmic powers that the devil uses in his hands as tools to distract us from God, to keep us from God, to keep us locked and captive in a state of brokenness. That's, that's, the, that's sort of the story of broad brushstrokes uh, that Jesus enters into. It's a hopeless state of death and sin and Hades and the enemy, the powers of this age at work. And Jesus comes and he enters into this as a merciful king. You know, Jesus was born as a baby, but he grew up. We don't hear a ton of what happened between his infancy and his life as an adult, but When we do learn about Jesus on the pages of the gospels, Jesus is a teacher, but Jesus also demonstrates his power over the powers. He is raising people up from dead. He is uh, from death. He's uh, exercising demonic powers out of people who are held captive by demonic powers. Jesus is speaking and calming the wind and the sea. Jesus is in control of everything. There's this glimpse of hope in the gospels that Jesus is the one who was coming to undo all the things that were broken and make all things new, to be the victor over the things that hold us captive. And he certainly did that. But what happened in his life at his 33rd year is Jesus was crucified on a cross. Good Friday, two days ago, we we thought about that and reflected on that in a service here, that Jesus, the son of God, the king, was crucified on a Roman cross. And in that moment, as some of the Jews and the Roman people nailed Jesus to a cross, mocked Jesus, killed Jesus, and he breathes his last, the devil himself thought he had won, right? This ancient story that he had been a part of, distracting humanity. At that moment, the devil thinks and believes with all of his heart that he has finally severed humanity from God. He has finally killed God. And so the devil celebrates. What he doesn't know and what the scripture tells us is as soon as Jesus breathes his last and dies as a human being, he bursts death open. Death cannot hold this man named Jesus because this man is not only perfect, this man is God. And as soon as his divinity hits the grave, it explodes death. Jesus comes and doesn't just deal with death. He actually takes all of our sin on his back and deals with it, pays the consequence. So at that moment, sin is forgiven. The scripture talks about Jesus even going and uh, to the other regions under the earth and, and setting free the captives in Hades. 
that Jesus now holds the keys to this place called Hades and brings people into life with him. It's this story, this amazing story of victory. When all people thought that Jesus was gone and it failed, Jesus had conquered over all the powers and forces keeping us from God and keeping us from life. Jesus conquered the villain of all villains in his death and his resurrection. That is why we celebrate Easter, because it is a victory for Jesus and a victory for us. I want to give you a couple passages in the scripture just to paint broad brushstokes of what Jesus does and how he's this victorious conqueror. A man named Paul, who never met Jesus most likely, but became Jesus's uh, most ardent follower and wrote a lot of the books of the Bible. His name's Paul. He said this, He says, when he ascended Jesus on high, his resurrection and his ascension, he took captives captive. Those held captive by sin, death, and the devil, Jesus takes them captive for himself as a good king. And he gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? The one who descended, went down into death and Hades is the one who also ascended far above all heavens to fill all things. What a cool passage of Jesus the victor reaching into death and pulling dead people up from life, taking us in our captivity and making us free and captive to the one who made us. Uh, There's a story in the gospel of Matthew that talks about what happened in the moment that Jesus died. It says that the earth shook, the rocks cracked, the the temple with the uh, curtain was torn in two, opening access to God for all people who would trust in Jesus. And it says this also happened, which is crazy. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. Could you, could you imagine that? Like being in, in the tri-cities and all of a sudden the tombs are being opened and people are coming out from death to life and walking around the city, people that you know should be dead walking in front of you. You're like, that's my grandpa, right? That's a friend over here. Like there's dead bodies who have now been made alive walking around the city. And the reason people are doing this is that Jesus destroyed the power of death. And as soon as he died, that victory was applied to dead bodies being raised to life. Crazy stuff. Uh, There's an image that uh, the early church and Christians throughout the centuries uh, have love to reflect on. It's an imaginative uh, portrait of what this power looks like. And I'll put it on the screen. I had an opportunity to get my own version of it when I was in Greece this last fall, visiting one of our local partners in Greece. And uh, it's called the Anastasis, the, the resurrection image icon. And uh, it's a beautiful picture. This one's painted on the ceiling uh, of a Byzantine church. But what you have in the middle is you have Jesus, uh, at least you know, their imagination of what he might've looked like in his glory and power, robed in white. Uh, He's in a place called Hades, right? With a rock cave. He's standing on the gates of Hades that he has burst open in his life and death. And underneath him is the enemy, the devil, death personified. And underneath it is all the keys and the locks that held Hades closed to the dead. And Jesus in his resurrection comes, bursts open those gates, bursts open those locks, Uh, binds Satan, is standing on him in victory. And on the left, he's grabbing our ancient father, Adam. And on the right, he's grabbing our ancient mother, Eve, and he's pulling them out of death. And it's a portrait of what Jesus is doing for all of humanity that trusts in him, pulling them up out of death. One of the reasons I love this picture is because Jesus, you see, is not pulling them up by their hands, right? If he's pulling up by their hands and Adam and Eve are, they're also pulling themselves out with Jesus. Look where he's grabbing them. He's grabbing him by the wrist. Through his power, through his life, through his grace, he is pulling death to life. That's what Jesus is doing for all people who turn to him. And you've got saints from different generations looking on to what Jesus is doing. What a beautiful portrait of the Easter message of Jesus, the victor, the conqueror over the powers that be. And that long intro brings us into this passage in Revelation. I promise it won't be a super long sermon. But I want us to look at a passage real quick from Revelation chapter one, because this man named John, who was a disciple of Jesus and later wrote books in the Bible about Jesus, has this vision of that kind of Jesus, Jesus, the conqueror, Jesus, the victor, the one who holds the keys to death and Hades and tells us about the significance of the resurrection. 
Uh, we're going to look at verse 12 through 18, read through it, reflect for a second. If you do know the book of Daniel, John sees Jesus as the son of man that Daniel centuries before heard about and was waiting for, the son of man who would come down and get universal dominion over all things. John is saying, that is Jesus. John says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the son of man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it's fixed or fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. No one's come before me. No one will come after me. And I am the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And look what he says. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. He holds the keys to the powers of death and the place of death that holds humanity captive. Therefore, he says, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. John describes here an image of a glorified king named Jesus who has had victory over all the things that we could not have victory ourselves, namely sin, death, and the devil. So Jesus' resurrection is not just happy news. It's good news, and it's a news of victory over a villain that we could not conquer ourselves. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have you guys start passing out these keys. I had a couple of kids ask what these are for. These are fun. Uh, at the front here, you can see there's a basket of keys. You have to grab it. You can just take one and keep passing it until everyone has a key in their hands. It's okay if it makes a little bit of noise. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So Jesus' uh, resurrection is a victory, but I want us to make sure we don't miss something because we would be wrong to just stop there, that it's a victory and not say who it's a victory for. Because Jesus' victory is a victory for every single human being that would turn to Jesus. In fact, if I could just apply it to our room here, Jesus' victory is for you. No matter what your background is, what you bring with you today, whether you know Jesus, whether you are far from Jesus, whether you like Jesus this morning or don't, the message of the resurrection victory is for you. Jesus holds the keys for you. Uh, our passage here in Revelation was written to a group of Christians living after Jesus' death and resurrection. He's in heaven, but his church is living in a world uh, where there's persecution, where there's questions about well, when is Jesus going to return? What happens when the world gets tough? What are we supposed to do? And John is, through Jesus, encouraging the church in the world to conquer through faith because they have a king who already conquered. And the message in Revelation is for the church to hold on hope because of the victory of Jesus. It is a message that's not just up here at 30,000 feet. It's a message for you and for me and for every person throughout the ages. I want to just kind of unpack real quick the three significant ways that the resurrection is a victory for you today. The first one is that Jesus, through his victory, now holds the keys to relationship with God. It's not a real popular message, but it's true and it's in the scripture that all of us are stained with sin. All of us are sinful and deserve uh, the consequence and punishment of sin. All of us, without exception, have the power of sin working in us, infiltrating us, uh, disrupting who we are and working through us. And, and as sinful people, we cannot stand in the presence of God. We cannot have relationship with God when we are stained with sin. But Jesus comes in his death and resurrection to solve that problem for us and to bring us into relationship with God. You see that even in the passage we just read from uh, Revelation, John's reaction to this glorious Jesus. It says, again, Jesus had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. His face was shining like the sun at full strength. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. John is terrified of who he's seeing. In fact, Jesus has to lay his hand on him and say, don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. 
All of us cannot stand before God and live on our own. That's just the, the state of humanity. It's not the way God wants it, but it's the way that things are. And through Jesus and through his victory over death and the grave, Jesus has now paved a way for every single person to come to God and to be restored to him, to be forgiven, and to have life in the presence of our creator. Not because of anything that you've done, not because you've proven yourself, but because Jesus has been pulling you up by your wrists, by his grace, and presenting you to his father. That's the hope we have in the resurrection, that Jesus holds the keys for you to be restored to the father who made you. Jesus also now through his victory holds the keys over fear and death. He holds the keys even for your life to unlock places where you are stuck in fear and anxiety over death. I'd share a little bit about myself. I've shared in the past that I, I struggle with anxiety and fear and it's manifested itself in different ways throughout different parts of my life. And uh, as I've gotten older, especially through my 20s when I got married and had kids in my mid-30s now, that fear over time has increased, especially when you've got kids in the picture and you're all of a sudden like, well, I don't want to die, but I also don't want to leave my wife and I don't want to leave my kids. And in my mind, that kind of races sometimes, there have been seasons where I have been so afraid. It's, it's crippling. It's all I think about. Um, people have told me that uh, I'm like an undiagnosed hypochondriac constantly worried about what's going on with me and with my body, afraid that I'm going to get cancer, afraid that I'm going to get hit by a car, that I'm not going to live. It's just this thing that lives in my head and it's hard to free myself from it. A couple of years ago, I was just struggling with a little bit of physical pain in my stomach area. And of course, that's like a trigger for all kinds of fear. Thinking all the time about when am I going to die? When am I going to get the diagnosis? And uh, went through a lot of testing and praise, the God, praise God, it was, it was all clear. But through that season, I was terrified. And I remember coming to my wife and coming to even talking with friends about it, like just feeling stuck, held captive by this fear that I had no idea how to work myself through. And I remember praying about it. And this is probably TMI, but it's true. I remember praying in the shower one morning, just overwhelmed with fear. And I don't remember exactly what the Lord put on my heart, but it was something along the lines of, no matter what happens to you, I have you. Not even death can separate you from me. And it reminded me of that passage that Paul talks about where Paul is like, I don't know what's gonna happen to me, but if I, if I live, I live for the Lord. And if I die, I go to the Lord. Like it doesn't matter which way it goes, God has me. Jesus has had victory over death, the source of all of our anxieties and fears. The thing that no one wants to taste, Jesus is like, I got you. I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the living one. In fact, death is, uh, yes, sad because you leave things behind that's never easy, but death is an entry into life with me forever. And even though I've gone to church my entire life, raised as a pastor's kid, been to so many Easter services about the resurrection, it had not clicked in my heart like it did that day. And it didn't solve everything. I still have fear over those things from time to time, but it has significantly transformed my fear over death. That slavery to a fear over something that I have no control over. And the scripture talks about Jesus entering into the space and unlocking it for us and freeing us. The book of Hebrews chapter two says this, now since the children of, my, of have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these. He became like us in every way except without sin. So that through his death, listen to this, he might destroy the one holding the power of death, the devil, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. That victory that Jesus overcame in the grave is a victory for you, especially you who are locked in that slavery over the fear of death, whether that's for yourself or for other people. And even recognizing there are people in this room right now that are suffering with, with end of life or are suffering through cancer or things that you just can't answer in your life. And I have no desire to downplay that. But I do want to remind you, if you are in that place, that the resurrection message is for you. It's Jesus reminding you that he holds the keys to your life and he will bring you from death to life. He's already conquered the grave. Your grave is a doorway into the kingdom of God with Jesus. He holds that key for us. Jesus' victory over the grave and sin and death is also means he has the keys over the power of sin and death. Not just the consequence, but the power. 
Jesus has the power now, holds the keys to actually get to work inside of us who are broken, sort of like the walking dead in the world to change us and renew us and to give us a new lease on life. Uh, Again, like we are people who are infiltrated with sin. It spreads like a poison. It spreads in our minds, our hearts, our actions, our lives. It, It manifests itself in decisions that we make that hurt us. Sin manifests itself in relationships that we might harm or hurt. Jesus, through his resurrection, has the power for everyone to enter into that with a power that can actually change your life. I can't tell you how many stories I have witnessed and heard where Jesus, including my own, where Jesus can enter into a life and begin to change people from the inside out and completely change the trajectory of their lives. Uh, In fact, I I, I try to be careful to not oversell or or hype up the change because I don't want people to be disappointed when it doesn't happen like that. But the scripture speaks about a power available through Jesus's resurrection to change even the people who are farthest from God, even the people who have messed up their life, even the people who are living uh, in a way that you look at and might say like, that person has no hope. Jesus can come and renovate and change that person from the inside out. Again, Paul in uh, Romans, another book he wrote, talks about this power at work. And, and he's, he's offering us something that is true. He says this, now, if Christ is in you, which is the promise for everyone who looks to Jesus by faith. He lives in you. The body is dead because of sin. Anyone agree with that? Amen. But the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And at the spirit of Christ, who was of God, who who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the spirit who lives in you. Here's what Paul's saying. It's not just in the future that the spirit comes and brings people from death to life. That is true. That's our hope. But even in this day, Paul's talking to people about change in their present situation, that that spirit now works backwards into the life of people, bringing new life and change so that we actually through our mortal bodies that are dead by sin can actually begin to live resurrected lives. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. And Jesus begins to make us more like himself, changing our thoughts, changing our habits, changing the way that we live. And Jesus holds the keys for you to experience a life that you've never experienced. Change over things that you did not think that could change in your life. Change in relationships that you did not think could change. Change in forging you and putting you into a community of people like the church that will help you find an identity in Christ and live with him. He holds the keys over the power of sin and death at work in your life to bring newness of life. So the victory of Jesus is not just an isolated story from 2000 years ago. It's not just a story about the end or a story kind of up here that we talk about. It's a story that is very present and personal for every single person here and every single person in the world. It's a victory for humanity. So Jesus' resurrection is a victory. It's a victory for you and it's a victory for me. And I I wanna close with this that Jesus holds the key to your life. And I want to just close here by addressing all of us as honestly and transparently as I can. And I know I can't hit everyone in the room, but I don't want us to leave thinking that the resurrection doesn't apply to our situations. There's something here in the resurrection for every single person in this room. Uh, For you, if you are struggling in a relationship with God, Jesus' victory over death and the grave is for you. I recognize in this room right now, there are some of you who do not have a relationship with God. That might be because in your mind, you know your life and you know the life you've lived and you, you know the life you're living. And the thought of God looking at you as lovable is the most crazy thing you could think about. You don't think God could look at you and love you and welcome you and forgive you. I wanna remind you the resurrection message is a promise that Jesus knew you when he came into the world. He knew the life you'd live, the mistakes you'd make, the way you'd rebel around him and run from him. He knew all that and he still came for you. He went to a cross on Good Friday for you. And he was raised from the grave for you personally. And I hope that can maybe allow you to open yourself to a God who does look at you in the midst of all of your brokenness and finds worth and value and gives redemption. Uh, You might be here this morning and that's not your struggle with God. Your struggle is you don't like God. And maybe you have a perspective of God that he is angry, he's unfair. Maybe in your mind, he's just like one of those villains we saw on the screen. 
through your experiences, that's what you've concluded. The resurrection message reminds us that those visions of God, versions of him in our minds, are not true. God would send his son into the world to die for you. And he raised, when the power worked from him through the spirit to raise his son from death to life, he was doing that for you. So that you might change your perspective of who he is and give him an opportunity and a chance to work in your life. And I hope this morning, if that's you, that you'll give him that opportunity. This morning, if you are here and you are gripped by fear, maybe it's fear over death, maybe it's fear over failures, maybe it's fear over uh, the unknown, or maybe it's all those three and a couple other ones. I want to I wanna remind you and tell you this morning, the resurrection message is for you. That as crazy as it sounds, when Jesus reaches down and touches John's shoulder and says, don't fear, he says that to you too. He says, I'm the first, no one's come before me. I'm the last, no one comes after me. I have you. No matter what happens in life, I have you. Yes, you will have hard times. You will struggle, you will suffer, you will suffer but I have you, I love you, I welcome you, you are mine. That's what the resurrection preaches and promises to us. We can be freed from the slavery of fear. And so that when we feel that fear, we have a place to run. This morning, you might be stuck in unhealthy habits. Habits that are hurting you, maybe physically or relationally. Habits that are causing ruckus in your workplace, in your home, in your families. And you're here this morning and you feel like a wreck. I want to tell you this morning, first of all, I'm glad you're here. Church is a place for people who are struggling like that. But also that Jesus' death and resurrection is there to help you break free and find freedom in those relationships and freedom in those habits. There is not a single habit that we're stuck in that Jesus cannot work his resurrection power in. And that victory, the keys that Jesus holds can begin that work in you today. And it won't happen overnight where you wake up and all of a sudden you're freed from things, but the spirit of Christ will live in you if you turn to him and he will begin to work renovation in you that you cannot get anywhere else. I'm a huge fan of counseling, but you cannot get that change without the spirit working in you. Um, I'm not a fan of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but if you're trying that, that will not bring change. But Jesus Christ, the one who has victory over the, the grave, sin and death can change your life. And I hope you'll hear that and give Jesus an opportunity today. Here's the last one. Jesus can give you purpose. This morning, if you are feeling aimless, purposelessness or purposeless, feeling like there's not really a purpose in your life, you're struggling to find meaning and value, Jesus, through the message of his resurrection, can give you purpose and value. Because the way the resurrection works is it now opens up a future for us. We know where we're headed. We know who Christ is. Our eyes are focused on that. And it has a way of now working its way back and changing everything in our present. It changes you in your vocation, no matter what you do. You now have purpose because you are working with Christ and moving towards a new creation. It changes the way you see things, the way you see yourself. It changes how you think about your time and your resources. It changes everything. And the victory over the grave can give you purpose. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. He's picking up on this in reality, the people who are doing the most here, who have purpose and meaning and are bringing change to the world are those who aren't, they're not, you know, uncaring about the the present, but they're just focused on the future. And they're bringing that future into the present. Jesus can do that in your life too and give you a purpose and meaning you cannot find anywhere else. So the purpose of this key, um, I hope you'll hold on to it, is to remind you of that. Now, there's no etching in it, so it doesn't get you into any special doors here at the church. You can try it, but it's not gonna do anything. It won't get you anywhere. But I would encourage you to hold on to it. Put it on your keychain. Put it somewhere in your car where you can see it to remind you when you are feeling stuck in your relationship with God, in relationship with people, in your own personal life, you're feeling stuck like you cannot move an inch farther into more depth and health. This key can remind you that Jesus holds the keys to help you. He's bringing you from death to life. He's bringing you into relationship with God. He's bringing you to his new creation. And this can be a reminder and a symbol that doesn't rely on you, but you have a king who has conquered and who is for you. So hold on to it if you want to. Um, Pass it on to someone who needs it. 
but I hope this can be an encouragement to you in your life today as you leave here. I just wanna end here with uh, a couple of verses also from Revelation 1 that just talk about where history is headed. Uh, Because we've been talking about keeping our eyes on Jesus, focusing on him and letting his victory shape our life. And John says, history is moving in this direction anyway, where all people will see Jesus. Listen to what he says here. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of earth, all kings, to him who loves us, who has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. And then John says, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, amen. John is telling us what is going to happen. We don't know when, but when Jesus comes back, every eye will see him and behold him. And the world will mourn over him, especially those who pierced him and those who resist him. But for those who have their eyes on Jesus, who are hoping in his victory and his resurrection, will be welcomed into Jesus' arms and into his kingdom forever, where there is no sin, no death, no power of sin working in you, where there is health and goodness and flourishing in the presence of God. And so if that's the future, we may as well get started now, keeping our focus on the risen one who has conquered the grave. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for uh, your life and your death and your resurrection. There is no hope without it. And Jesus, you know better than we know that we are incapable of moving towards your father or moving uh, from death to life without your grace in our life. So Jesus, thank you that you came into our world, uh, that you walked in our shoes and that you went to a cross and that in the grave, you destroyed the powers of things that we have no hope to conquer on our own. And Jesus, I pray that this morning uh, that you would work in the hearts of your people here. Jesus, you know every single person in this room, every name, every story, every struggle. Lord, you know, you know everything better than we know ourselves. And Jesus, I pray that by the power of your spirit this morning, you would begin to work and mend hearts. Lord, you give us hope in your resurrection power, that you would help us to find meaning in who you are. Jesus, you are powerful. You are the reason that we gather. You are the reason that we live. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. We're going to continue to worship this morning and give Jesus and his Father and the Spirit the praise they deserve. I just want to encourage you, if, if you've been stirred or moved this morning uh, to take a, a next step, we're going to have some folks to my left over here who would love to pray with you. Uh, would love to, to hear you, pray with you, and even talk with you if you've got questions. Also in front of you, if you'd be more comfortable doing this, there's a piece of paper where you can write prayer requests. If you're ready to take a next step or, or you're, you've made a decision this morning, would you just write that down? Uh, we'd love to be able to reach out to you and, and answer questions for you, walk alongside you as you journey with Christ. Because when you journey with him, there's, there's questions you need community. So please fill that out and drop it in the black box. We'd love to, to, love, or to, love to walk alongside you with that. So uh, as we're singing, feel free to come up, pray, write something down and just let's, let's worship and give Jesus the glory that is due him.